Yeah, so far in module 5, we looked at uh, the electronic properties of materials and in module 6, we are going to take a look at the optoelectronic properties of material, materials which combine both the optical property as well as the electronic property together. We call this as optoelectronic properties because most of the gadgets that we use in uh, today's life, we couple both the optical property of a material and the corresponding electronic property of a material to harvest either informations or to harvest displays. So, generally these are termed as uh, optoelectronics and in the next few lectures I would be concentrating on some of the materials which really stand out in today's technology which will uh, underline the need for why we need new materials and also I will try to explain in the next few uh, lectures uh, why organic molecules plays an important role in optoelectronic devices. Today if you are handling any of the gadgets like iPod or um, cell phone or uh, palm computers all the displays are more or less governed by small molecules either they are metal organic uh, complexes or uh, much more easier version could be the organic molecules. So, <coughs> uh, as we looked at the genie inside a lattice which brings in magnetism and electronic properties together, uh, I have coined this term the genie in organic molecules. Uh, there is a great potential in every organic molecule especially when you consider optoelectronic properties and we need to understand what these uh, governing properties are, what are the issues that are involved in controlling optoelectronic properties. So, uh, when we think of uh, organic molecules for optoelectronic applications, we can uh, by and large call that area as organic photonics. In other words, uh, photonic applications that are actually uh, initiated by uh, using organic molecules. To stand out um, clearly, uh, there are two important applications which underline the importance of organic molecules. One is called organic LEDs and uh, the other upcoming area is uh, photovoltaics or solar cells. In this year, January 2000, uh, 2000, uh, sorry, 2010, uh, there was an article or in a conclave they decided that uh, the technology for 2010 will be the year of LED displays. And uh, true to this uh, decision made by uh, those in the display technology, um, several versions of organic displays have come into picture in this year. And uh, needless to say that this technology is going to affect uh, the uh, landscape of uh, photonic applications displays uh, in a very big way in the next 5 years. And um, uh, because this year is a year of uh, LED displays, I personally thought that we should lay more emphasis on organic displays compared to even inorganic displays. Uh, for those who are wondering why uh, we talk about organic displays, because all the gadgets that you use currently show some sort of a LED response and they are all based on inorganic materials and mainly those are governed by gallium nitride. Uh, inorganic materials based on gallium nitride are the ones which are used in photonic mate uh, display materials. Uh, so, therefore, I would like to emphasize more on the use of organic. <coughs> this cartoon tells that uh, the more we go for uh, different gadgets, the more we are interested uh, in full color display. Nobody is settled with uh, a black and white or a monochrome display. Those days have gone. We are looking not only for uh, multicolor display, but we are looking for high resolution display. So, what is this uh, which governs a full color display? <coughs> full color displays 
are basically initiated by the use of organic materials in today's technology and whatever color that you are seeing is nothing but manifestation of organic materials that are coated on the screen. Whether you call it a, a computer display monitor or TV monitor or anything, uh, these are all coated with choice organic materials. Uh, <coughs> this is uh, the recent display uh, <coughs> made by Sony and uh, as you see here, um, this is a Sony market which is actually bringing out a new generation OLED TV, this is high density TV. It looks like a computer monitor, but this is actually a TV and the whole display whatever you see here, the display here, this is all projected from a organic LED screen. So, the display that is responsible uh, or the light that is coming out of this uh, display unit is mainly organic molecules. It is not based on gallium nitrate, but it is based on organic molecules. So, this is almost uh, a most uh, a recent uh, <coughs> invasion and you would also see in the market uh, 3D uh, OLED displays are being advertised by Samsung. Um, so, all the new generation displays uh, have bigger screens this can vary from 29 inch to 41 inch display screens mostly governed by organics. <coughs> the cartoons here shows another generation of uh, displays that are coming, these are called flexible substrates, <coughs> flexible substrates where you can use it in variety of application even in car uh, windshield and so on you can actually have some displays coming and mainly this is coming from organic electronics. Only with organics you can make such flexible displays. With inorganic uh, phosphors or inorganic uh, photoluminescent material, it is impossible to make such flexible ones. Here is a situation where you can display uh, on a flexible screen. This is with the paper uh, substrate. This is not, this is with a polymer substrate, usually it is a PET based uh, substrate, but here this is a paper substrate on which displays can be um, initiated and this is actually brought up by Siemens. And here is another display may not be uh, of a very high quality, but essentially tells you that you have another flexible substrate which can be used in your pen. This is a pen holder where you can actually pull out a screen and then you can scroll it back. So, you can just pull and scroll it back whenever you want, displays are made here. So, these are flexible substrates on which organic molecules are used for displays. And here is another classical uh, example of what um, the organic uh, displays can do. This is the new generation Kodak. Uh, uh, cameras that are coming digital cameras and uh, the beauty is the display what you get here is now made of OLED display material. And you can also see here this is also a OLED material uh, reason why we need OLED material because you have the same sharpness and it almost consumes one tenth of the power that uh, uh, gallium nitrate based LED will consume. Therefore, you have a longer battery life and uh, you get better resolution and also you can make wider uh, wider screen or large area display. Therefore, you can do this at a um, very economically viable uh, way you can generate bigger display. So, th this is catching up and uh, in a few years from now all the displays in our electronic gadgets that we handle will all be organic. And uh, this is a uh, example of a digital frame. Now, this is coming into picture, you have so many photos that you store in your cameras and you do not know when to see it. You can actually take your hard drive from the camera and you can put it in this digital frame at home it will keep on displaying all thousands of photos that you are uh, 
uh, copying. So, this may be a good entertainment to uh, keep the visitors occupied when they are sitting in the living room waiting for you. And here is another uh, OLED display from, uh, from a foreign company which shows a full color display mainly tuned from organic LEDs. Um, and of course, uh, needless to say you also have the mobile which is made of OLED and there are other applications where you can look for uh, OLED. This is uh, a table lamp made of uh, OLED lighting and uh, the important uh, advantage is this gives you cool light, more brightness, but it is still cooler, it does not irritate your eyes and also the efficiency of this organic lamps are very high that you can even operate with uh, uh, 3 volt battery. You do not you, you don't need uh, even an AC supply, you can just uh, do it wherever you want, you get the same brightness and uh, lot of uh, lighting applications are also affected these days using organic LEDs. Then the whole question comes, where is my organic material in this uh, uh, device devices? and uh, how does the organic uh, material uh, work or what is the mechanism by which this organic material throws light. So, that is a good question to ask. So, uh, the question we will try to answer in the next few slides, how does a organic device works. This is a simple example of a diode. Um, if you have uh, a diode and if you connect it to a battery, then the electrons go from the anode material yeah uh, so the electron flows from the anode material and uh, the uh, sorry the holes go from the anode material and the electron flows from the cathode and you can see here at this interface um, you have both the uh, holes and electrons uh, combining and um, uh, photons come out during this uh, excitonic uh, recombination. When the, when the photons come out at this interlayer, yeah. so in this animation you would see a, a electron and uh, a hole recombining. So, at this interface if you can put an organic layer then the photon can actually excite the uh, organic material and the desired light can be harvested. <coughs> So, this is typically the view diagram of a basic OLED structure where you have uh, a cathode on the top and you have a anode um, at the bottom. Anode is preferably a ITO indium tin oxide which is coated in glass therefore, it is a transparent anode. It is a transparent anode. Cathode can be opaque, cathode typically can be aluminum or uh, calcium uh, and between this there are uh, crucial layers, but the layer of importance to us is the organic layer which we call this as emissive layer EML and uh, you, you can sandwich this uh, organic layer with the electron transport layer because the electrons has to flow from here towards the emissive layer and the holes have to flow from here towards the uh, emissive layer. So, you have to control the traffic or control the mobility of the organic uh, or, or of the electron as well as the holes and you should make sure that the combination of electron and the hole both occurs at the emissive layer. So, when there is a combination of electron hole pair which forms a exciton that exciton will give away photon which will excite in turn your organic material. So, there are lot of crucial issues that are involved in this it is not a simple 5 layer structure which forms a OLED because the number of electrons that keeps coming here and the number of holes that are going towards the emissive layer both needs to be controlled. Not only that the speed with which these electrons come here and the speed with which the holes come at the emissive layer which we call it as mobility 
mobility of the carriers also matter. So, a proper recombination has to occur in this uh, layer. If this is not effective, then the combination can happen here or the combination can happen in this region and thereby giving some other light which is not of a desired nature. So, there are several issues involved in selecting the electron transport and the whole transport layer and the issues related to uh, emissive layer and also the homo lumo gap of cathode, homo lumo gap of ITO all these are crucial ingredients in designing a organic LED. So, this is a basic structure uh, we will come to the issues later. Now, if I am going to put organic um, materials here incidentally these are also organic materials which are polymeric in nature. So, if I am going to put organic materials here now what are all the issues that will decide the basic performance of a LED which we can see. Uh, <coughs> now there are different ways that I can harvest light from this organic LED structure. The, the different combinations for a full color display I would like to touch. Uh, basic lights, uh, basic colors are red, uh, blue and green and combination of red, blue and green gives white light okay. and mix of these two colors gives you uh, yellow, mix of these two colors gives you magenta and then cyan. Okay. So, combination of RGB gives you white light therefore, you essentially get a full spectrum display when you have material which can give uh, red light, material which can give blue, material which can give green light. So, if you are looking for a full color display of this nature then there are three approaches one is take a red and try to get red color as you see in this case and green for green, blue for blue which means you are going to use three materials to get all three uh, colors and another one is to go for uh, blue to uh, red, blue to green and blue to blue down conversion where blue is of a high energy emission therefore, you can put proper filters here and try to get from blue a down conversion to red, blue down conversion to green, blue down conversion to blue. So, this is another way you can actually get your RGB colors, this is another way to get RGB color. The uh, other approach which is of interest to us is uh, take a white light emitting molecule and put filter here, okay. filter to get only red color and filter to get only green filter to get only blue color. So, you are essentially having only one molecule and you are getting three different colors. So, this way you can actually minimize on your um, device uh, fabrication protocol instead of having three uh, materials or instead of going for down conversion you use one material which gives full color spectrum, but use proper filter to get only the desired light. So, this way also you can get RGB. There are different approaches, uh, this is another approach which is popular in the market where people try to use blue and get all the colors, uh, very few white light emitting molecules are there. White light emitting molecules can be used for full color display as well as for white light emission for OLED lamps or for lighting applications. Therefore, um, making white light emitting molecules uh, has dual advantage, one is you can down uh, convert it for desired uh, lights, another thing you can use this white light molecules for even organic white, uh, organic white light emitting uh, lamps. So, for this reason there is special emphasis on white light emitting molecules and the companies are investing a lot of money uh, especially for white light emission. Uh, here is another uh, uh, protocol I have already told you, so I may not 
uh, run through this, but there are different ways of making a device, but need based you can actually get different uh, displays. Um, if you preferentially activate one of the pixel then you would get white or you would get green or you would get blue or you would get uh, red all from the same architecture and in such cases you need to have stackings of this order where you can get different pixels. Uh, this is uh, the, the uh, example that I quoted uh, in the previous slide. Uh, this is another example uh, which I emphasize from the previous slide on white LED and uh, this is the stacked uh, OLED which gives you this sort of performance. Uh, so, you have transparent contact for all the devices that you have, but the stack OLEDs essentially will give you um, the preferred light as and when you try to ask for it. Um, one of the uh, thing that we need to understand is how do I know what sort of molecule it is and how do I categorize different organic molecules and what is the number that I should resort to. This is based on CIE diagram uh, because it has been accepted to represent the color of your molecule based on CIE coordinates and CIE coordinates is actually based on a uh, two dimensional uh, uh, graphical plot which tells you the numbers. So, if, if you have a number marked here then the x and y component of that will give you an idea that it is a blue light emitting molecule. If you, uh, if you mark something here then you are talking about uh, your y coordinate uh, and x coordinate which, which gives you typically a pure green one we are actually concerned about white and if you look at it white light emitting molecule the magic number for that comes somewhere here and it is usually 0 0.33 0 0.33. So, if your x and y of your CAE coordinates is 0 0.33 0 0.33 you are talking about a proper mix of blue, green and red together they give you a white light whose coordinates are mentioned as 0 0.33, 0 0.33. Either way if it is not matching to 0 0.33 then one of the colors will dominate. So, this is the way you usually categorize what sort of molecule you have. So, that such a molecule if you give the CAE coordinates will immediately be uh, uh, you know used for a specific application. Uh, where, do, where did it all start? Uh, we need to actually give uh, credit for uh, Tang and Vanslick who actually brought the uh, ALQ3 into focus and this is uh, typically a, a, a ALQ3 complex which is actually in the animation and um, uh, if you make a device uh, such as glass ITO uh, diamond uh, and ALQ3 capped with the cathode then you can see that uh, a OLED performance occurs where with increasing voltage you see the current and the light intensity exponentially going. This was the first demonstration as early as 1987 and I should also uh, record uh, this as a historical fact because 1986 and 1987 has been a path breaking years for most of the discoveries as far as uh, electronic and opto electronic applications are concerned. As I discussed with you in uh, module 5, I have told you how the lanthanum manganate was uh, discovered to show uh, colossal magneto resistance that was in 1986 one paper came and then 1986 also this high temperature superconductivity came into picture where this wonder molecule was discovered yttrium barium copper oxide that was also in 1986 and again you see here 1989 the first report on organic LED was published. Therefore, these are really crucial and formative years where many path breaking device application oriented 
discoveries were made in solid state materials. Therefore, uh, this is a golden era in one sense to say solid state chemistry came into much of focus because in solid state whether it is organic molecule or a inorganic solid both started showing interesting properties. So, <coughs> um, I will uh, go one step further to highlight to you what exactly is happening in these uh, compounds, uh, why light is coming at all. Um, as I told you if there is an electron and a hole that is combining they form a excitonic pair and this exciton pair will liberate photon and it will die down. So, this photon can be used for activating any or uh, um, promoting any molecule or exciting any molecule. So, what really happens between a hole and the electron uh, when hole and electron combines they actually form a whole electron pair which further leads to singlet exciton as I shared with you in while discussing organic spin valves I told you the percentage of uh, singlet excitons uh, according to spin statistics is 25 percent and triplet exciton is 75 percent. Um, with this 25 percent comes all the light that you are harvesting from an organic molecule because triplet exciton is a slow process spin forbidden but it goes through a radiation less deac uh, deactivation, but it is possible one to harvest this triplet exciton convert it into singlet excitons and you can try to increase on the efficiency of your um, excitonic emission governed by singlets. So, once you get a singlet exciton it can again go through a thermal deactivation which can be useless uh, does not really merit any attention or it can actually go through a emission process and this emission can actually go through another uh, two effects one is the external emission and that is what is exactly coming out as displays as displays but the internal reflection loss is something that we need to put up with that is why most of the displays you see a heating effect coming and that is all because of the light that uh, that goes as a internal loss. So, uh, there are many ways that this internal loss is being minimized in this new generation display materials, but we are concerned now only about the external emission. So, this is the pathway by which you get light once you let hole and electron combine. So, this is the mechanistic uh, uh, process for a electroluminescent device. Now, what are all uh, the organic molecules which really govern such a show or what really controls the organic displays? Uh, we can uh, define that or we can uh, broadly divide it between two set of compounds one those which are um, polymeric in nature PPV for example is a classic example and even now in commercial devices PPV is used we will come to this later, but uh, the other wonder molecule is the molecular material and this is a typical example of aluminum Q3 and this is called as 8 hydroxy quinalinato aluminum 3 complex popularly abbreviated as ALQ3 and this ALQ3 this is the quinoline moiety and there are three such quinoline moieties which actually coordinate to aluminum center here and uh, you have the coordination actually happening from nitrogen this, this is a nitrogen atom and this is the oxygen atom Oxy, three oxygens actually satisfy the valency of your aluminum therefore, this is a electrically neutral molecule. ALQ3 and this ALQ3 is a wonder molecule because it was uh, used by Kodak for the first time uh, in device applications. So, this is actually nicknamed as Kodak molecule because this molecule is also covered by IPR by Kodak company therefore, uh, it is uh, a proprietary molecule 
and no one can infringe in using aluminum Q3 for making devices without the uh, permission from Kodak company. So, you, if you think of any organic molecule the first thing that should strike your mind is ALQ3. In fact, the Kodak company has brought out the digital display in the cameras which is actually made of ALQ3 and some other hybrid molecules. So, this is the most popular or billion dollar molecule so to say which is actually controlling the uh, optoelectronic applications as of now, but there are several such molecules which are being generated. We are going to see in next few lectures uh, a special study on uh, this ALQ3 or several other molecules which really govern the organic displays. So, having said that I have been talking to you more about uh, ALQ3 which is lying in this place in the device application, but there are several other organic molecules which also top up to the complexity or simplicity of this device. As I told you, you have a HTL that is whole transport material and you also have a electron transport uh, material. Uh, so, uh, these are the whole injecting layers uh, which are mostly polymeric in nature as you see here they are all polymeric in nature and it is very easy to grow such polymeric films by thermal evaporation. So, you can make a thin layer here uh, to get a good support you can also use intermediate layers like this which is uh, mostly P dot PSS we can come to that later and there are other whole transporting um, materials uh, which are NPB, uh, TPD this can also be used um, other than this whole injecting uh, layers and uh, we also have electron injecting layer which is happening here. Uh, these are the whole injecting layers. Uh, these are the uh, whole transport layers. Um, the electron uh, injecting layers are mainly um, coming from uh, molecules like lithium fluoride which are insulators therefore, they help electrons to accumulate at the cathode LIF interface and then they proceed together. So, instead of having a random electron transport across the interface they are they act like a barrier, but these barriers are of very thin uh, dimension. So, that all the electrons that are flowing they get collected at the interface and then they flow together as you would see the water gushing out of uh, uh, of the opening uh, flood gates from a dam all the electrons get accumulated and they flow into the electron transport layer. Um, these are the popular electron transport layers uh, one can think of uh, ALQ3 uh, it is both a emissive layer it is also a good electron transporting layer and uh, BCP is another layer PBD is another layer as you would see here mostly uh, in this combination you can either use a purely organic molecule small molecule or you can use a metal organic uh, complex whereas, uh, in the whole uh, transport materials it is predominantly small molecules or polymers which are used. So, just to give you an idea what it takes to make a organic uh, light emitting molecule you have several combinations that are in picture, but the grandeur of uh, a organic LED is based on the emissive layer. So, that has to be tuned properly so that you get all the necessary uh, you know uh, display informations that you can get. So, that is crucial. Uh, now, having discussed something about uh, what these molecules are and uh, how it basically works I will spend little time on how to fabricate a organic device uh, compared to uh, the multi layers that we discussed in the previous module on electronic materials organic uh, device making uh, efforts are rather uh, easier comparatively, but there is a stringent protocol that is followed because it has to be moisture free although it can be handled at very low vacuum conditions. Uh, 
in the spin electronic application or spintronic devices I emphasize that you need absolutely a very high vacuum. But in organic device applications you do not need very high vacuum, but a moderate vacuum of the order of 10 power minus 5 uh, tor that is enough. So, in the next few slides I will discuss with you about what it takes to make an organic device. Yeah, so, how to fabricate an organic device? Uh, this is a simple uh, bell jar uh, setup which can be used for making these devices and uh, this is a vacuum chamber um, and in this vacuum chamber you have source boards which are kept here and you can heat the source boards. Um, so, you can keep your organic molecules here and thermally you can evaporate this. This is a shutter which is kept there for a slow stream of this uh, molecules to come up and once the there is a, a proper uh, flux of this organic molecules coming then you can open the shutter and you can try to deposit in the substrate which probably you may be able to see here there is a substrate here and there is also a thickness monitor unit which is a quartz balance which is kept there which can measure um, the thickness of the layer that is coming uh, in terms of angstrom uh, how much angstrom of uh, the organic layer is formed per minute. So, you can essentially control uh, from say 10 to 20 nanometer or if you want to make a 70 nanometer thick film or a 100 nanometer thick film it is possible for you to control the thickness using a quartz monitor that is called thickness monitor that is kept inside uh, within the chamber. So, that you can effortlessly work on the thickness of the layer that you are depositing. So, uh, all it takes is to apply vacuum and then once the required vacuum is reached then you can uh, flush it with the, uh, some gas say argon and then uh, at optimum uh, pressure you can try to heat this uh, uh, sources and uh, there is a steady uh, flux of this organic molecule which is going and it will get deposited in a substrate. In a typical uh, experiment you can actually make uh, 5 to 6 uh, devices uh, at one time at one time. So, you can actually play with many devices if you can go for such a protocol. Uh, this is typically the way the chamber looks this is a device fabrication chamber. So, it, it may be alarming, but this is the way it is done uh, it involves uh, uh, all the other uh, electronics in it. So, just to give you a flare because uh, it is not as easy as you see here the machine actually looks a uh, bit more rugged as you see in this case this is the deposition chamber uh, in which you make the device. Now, once you do the device your first uh, idea or your uh, temptation would be to look at the electroluminescence, but before you do the electroluminescence you also should know what set of color your molecule is emitting. So, that you will know what is the shift in the color when you put it in uh, in a EL device, because this uh, machine gives you photoluminescence spectra that is your PL emission of your organic molecule will be C, but when you actually uh, develop a solid state material uh, then the electroluminescent EL emission need not be the same as your PL emission it can be different. At the same time if you can retain the same PL emission characteristics in EL emission then you have made a real good device. In any case you will get an idea about what the actual photoluminescent property of your material is and how you transcend to make another material with a device configuration. So, this will help you in interpreting uh, the uh, photophysical properties of your material. So, PL uh, instrument is actually used for getting PL emission and this is uh, a IV uh, measurement unit. Uh, which is just a unit involving multimeter and your current source. This will help you to get uh, current versus voltage uh, curve. 
So, if you are making a organic LED your electroluminescent device typically will have some feature like this where up to a particular voltage there will be no current and at this threshold voltage then you will see current flowing that means your electroluminescent device is going to produce light. Light will start appearing as after you have applied a threshold voltage. So, this information you can get out of this uh, IV measurement uh, curve and also this Minolta CS 100 can give you not only uh, an idea about the current density it will also tell you the luminescent density uh, as you increase the voltage as you increase the voltage the brightness or the uh, glow of your electroluminescent device will start increasing with increasing voltage. So, Minolta will give you the coordinates of your uh, light output and uh, typically the graph will look like this we will look at it later. So, having said that I just want to uh, concentrate now on few examples and show you how organic molecules can be used to fine tune color or to understand what is responsible for this uh, color uh, displays. So, I am going to take some examples in the next uh, uh, few slides. I will tell you what is this white light emission and uh, with few examples as to how to harvest white light because white light lighting is becoming popular and I will also tell you white light can be engineered not just from the organic molecule, but from the EL device. The device the way you make can also be manipulated to give you white light not necessary the white light has to come from the molecule. So, the EL uh, device has lot of features in it which controls the uh, light output. <coughs> so, first example confirmation dependent white light emission. What is this confirmation dependent? I am going to show you a molecule. Um, which is uh, actually called dibenzothiazolyl di uh, ethylene. There is a ethylene molecule which is actually integrating two uh, benzthiazole molecules. Therefore, it is called uh, cis-DBE uh, for convenience. I will use this abbreviation cis-DBE. This is nothing but benzthiazolyl because thiazole molecule is there, nitrogen, sulfur is there and uh, this is your benzene uh, ring. So, this is benzthiazolyl ethylene. Uh, so, two um, benzthiazolyl units are there which is integrated to a ethylenic uh, double bond. In this case this is a cis configuration therefore, you call it a cis db in this case this is trans configuration. So, you call this as uh, trans db and uh, it is easy to make uh, both cis and trans if you start with malic acid and fumaric acid. So, if you start with uh, two different uh, starting materials you can end up with uh, two geometrical isomers one is cis db one is trans db. So, essentially they are same stereochemically they are different. Now, uh, if you look at the dihedral angle then the angle is uh, 40 degree which means it is a bent molecule in this case it is uh, 177 degree across the uh, double bond. So, if you look at this uh, compound it is nearly planar whereas, in this case it is a bent molecule. So, uh, same molecule, but with different uh, conformers uh, what this has to do and how it affects the uh, EL emission. This is the photoluminescent characteristics of the stereoisomers. Uh, what you see here uh, the white uh, line that you see here is nothing but uh, your uh, cis db and you see this uh, uh, purple uh, curve which is nothing but your trans db. What you would immediately see is this is a more featured emission in the case of cis db compared to trans db although the broadening is uh, there for both the molecules you see there is a substantial broadening for the cis db con compared to trans db. So, if you actually look at the full width at half maxima, so you are talking about the full width at half maxima somewhere here. So, if you look at the uh, full width at half maxima it is more than 150 nanometers, 
it is more than 150 nanometers which means it covers part of the blue area if uh, blue light if it covers part of green and it also covers part of the red light emitting area. So, if you have all three components are coming then there is a broad emission which amounts to white light. Typically a white light emitting molecule should have full width at half maximum which is 150 nanometers. So, if it is a one, 150 nanometer uh, broad emission that means you have all three components in place and if they are of nearly equal intensity then you can clearly talk about a pure white light. So, what is the qu uh, question under discussion for us now you say cis db is giving white light and trans db is not giving white light, but both are same molecules just geometrically they are different. So, you can try to understand what really it uh, takes and uh, this is the uh, photoluminescent decay patterns of the stereoisomers as you would see for cis db it is very very different compared to trans db uh, this can be fitted to a double ex exponential model where both have nearly the same tau 2 values which is 0.7 nanoseconds which comes somewhere here the uh, linearity, but you have the tau 1 values which are different where cis db has a much faster um, ca decay component compared to trans db. You can actually try to translate I <coughs> will go to the next slide try to translate this dynamic photoluminescent um, spectra of this geometrical isomers. What do you do you shine light you just pump in light and then you excite the molecule allow that to decay for the first few nanoseconds and keep on capturing the light that is coming out at different nanoseconds. So, you can essentially plot um, for different uh, nanoseconds uh, a, a emission and you can also do that for cis db. As you can see here cis db in the first uh, uh, 2 nanoseconds the emission is here and as you le let, let it through to decay with different uh, nanoseconds you can see that the peak is shifting towards red. Whereas, if you look at trans db in the same time scale the peak maxima is still the same. So, in one case the peak maxima keeps on going to a red shifted emission in another case it is still the same. So, that means there are different singlet states I will come to this issue a bit more la uh, later in the uh, uh, slides to come. Uh, the, the singlet states that are responsible for this uh, fluorescence is different. Um, or in other words there are different singlet states that are responsible for PL emission as far as uh, cis db is concerned whereas for trans db there seems to be only one singlet which is responsible for emission. So, as a result when you let it decay only that particular chromophoric group or that singlet state is responsible for color emission. So, this much we can understand from the dynamic uh, photoluminescence spectra. Therefore, if you do a semi empirical calculation and try to look at what really is happening um, in the case of trans db uh, you would see that uh, the HOMO that is the hi highest occupied molecular orbital uh, the electron density mapping shows that the charge resonance is confined only to the benz thiazolyl ring uh, in the uh, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital the electron is actually uh, uh, the charge is transferred uh, across the ring through the ethylenic double bond in the excited state. Okay. If you look at the this slide is for uh, cis db and this is the situation uh, for the homo and this is the situation for the lumo and if you go to higher uh, levels for example, lumo plus 1 you can see that the charge resonance is not only happening between these two rings, but also there is a space charge resonance that is ha happening. Space charge resonance that is happening where there is a, 
um, uh, where there is a criss talk between two rings across the rings okay not through the bond so you have uh, both through bond effect and through space effect both are contributing to the charge resonance um, so this is the situation for homo minus 1 now let's see what really happens to trans db molecule in trans db you can uh, see that uh, in the homo the electron is delocalized and there is no significant change in the case of uh, lumo it is nearly remaining the same okay so uh, based on this one can conclude that in the case of cis db you have several singlet states which are responsible this homo plus 1 can contribute your lumo can contribute to uh, the emission whereas in the case of trans db the um, charge resonance seems to happen only via one singlet state okay as a result you can say that the several singlet states that are involved in uh, the cis db is responsible for the wide broad emission okay so white light emission in cis db is actually coming from several singlet states whereas it is uh, because of one singlet state which is responsible predominantly for emission in trans uh, you can try to use this cis db uh, with a uh, polyfluorine substrate or uh, uh, matrix you can mix it and make a device of this sort uh, aluminum cis db uh, p dot pss and ito if you make this at 8 volt you can see the threshold is somewhere here and at 8 volt you can see a nice device performance which is also showing a white light if you look at this here it is showing a white light um, at uh, approximately 8 volts but from device point of view 8 volt is not something which is interesting you need to go much lower but this is a proof of concept to say that white light can be produced with simple molecules like cis db if we can put it with the pfo matrix so this just to show you that uh, small molecules can be used for engineering white light i'm also going to give you another example in this case it is not a small molecule but it is a zinc complex of a benzthiazole and again i can show you that the, it is not only to do with the organic molecule but even the interface in uh, electroluminescence uh, device which can be responsible for um, white light and uh, this is the structure of a uh, zinc benzthiazole uh, molecule which actually shows a dimeric nature so we popularly mention this as a dimer like this and such a dimer can throw some light and the as you see here um, the electron mapping of the homo lumo shows that the electron density is always localized in one of the uh, organic uh, moieties and uh, if you look at the photoluminescent characteristics of this complex you can see here this is the pl emission of your bzt which is benzthiazole and once it is coordinated to zinc it is blue shifted and there is a shift in the pl uh, nevertheless the nature or the characteristics of your pl remains nearly the same which means it is dominated by ligand therefore it is ligand to metal charge transfer which is happening in Z, uh, zbzt and uh, this is typically the curve i want you to retain this in your memory because i am going to show to you how the el will look like and typically a el device looks like this this is the electroluminescent uh, uh, pattern of your uh, led device which has zinc benzthiazole here and uh, typically the thickness of this benzthiazole uh, layer is of the order of 80 nanometers and at 80 nanometers despite you vary the current density you still see a broad emission characteristics so if you look at the full width at half maxima you can see it is more than uh, this is somewhere around uh, 430 um, and then this is around so 
more than 250 nanome 200 nanometer uh, broadening is there when you use uh, zinc BZT in this device configuration. So, where does it come from because I already told you in the previous slide that the PL emission is only of this fashion whereas, in EL it is actually going through that. So, how can we evaluate that if you deconvolute this uh, EL spectra you can see several com uh, you know components that are responsible for this uh, light. And one of the way you can understand this is by varying the current density and with all the current density uh, values if the EL emission is going to be same then you call that mechanism as exciplex. So, the white light in this case is not actually coming from zinc benzthiazole, but zinc benzthiazole can actually form a exciplex pair with your whole transport layer and that exciplex pair will be responsible to give a white light like this. In the next lecture I will cover those issues, but I can just sum up for today um, that what is this exciplex that is forming. So, ITO actually electron uh, hole goes from here to TPD and electro uh, hole comes from here to the uh, interface region that is your ZN BZT and electron comes from uh, aluminum uh, to this layer and there is a exciplex pair that is forming here which is a uh, coulombic pair which is responsible for such a white light emission the mechanism of, of which we will discuss at a later stage. However, I should also tell you if I am going to change the ZBZT from 800 angstrom to 600 angstrom immediately you see that this broad emission is disappearing and the EL is resembling something of the PL of your Z and B Z T. Therefore, the interface effects are dominant in electroluminescent uh, devices. Therefore, one has to have a ex uh, caution exercise over the thickness of the organic layers that you are making. If you go for thick layers then the interface dominates over the photoluminescent property of the organic molecules. So, this is a classic example to show how the thickness can alter your uh, electroluminescent property. So, to uh, conclude uh, I just want to show you the pixel that is coming out of this uh, ZN BZT based LED which clearly shows that you have a uh, white light emission which is having a coordinates of 0 0.33, 0 0.33. So, two examples I have given to you one is a small molecule one is a molecular complex and both can give you broad emission, but the emission that comes from this particular example will lower the quantum efficiency while the emission that comes from cis db will contribute more to the quantum efficiency. The issues can be discussed at a later stage. So, I will conclude by showing that uh, there is a great excitement in display devices and uh, we are predominantly concentrating on white light emission examples of this white light emission I showed you two examples of a simple organic molecule which can help you fine tune the uh, color and also I told you how by controlling thickness of this organic layers one can get white light or modify the light. So, I stop here for now.